In this episode, we'll be covering a number of difficult and disturbing topics that relate to genocide and forms of mass violence. If you'd like to avoid those topics, feel free to click off now, but I hope you won't and that you'll stick around until the end of the episode. In a very broad sense, the term genocide refers to the intentional destruction of a people, and is most commonly used to describe the mass killing of particular national, ethnic, or religious minority groups. We'll get to other, more comprehensive definitions of the term later, but conceived in this way, there were numerous genocides in the last two centuries alone. And in researching this episode, I wanted to ask, faced with something that comprehensive and horrific, how do anthropologists and sociologists study genocide? Where do we even begin, and can we ever truly understand and theorize the phenomenon of mass violence? I'm trying to tell you I'm not your enemy, I'm a scientist. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. Well, anthropologists working in the field of genocide studies approach mass violence from three different, often irreconcilable, perspectives, which we sometimes call the triangle of violence. This includes the perspective of the victims, or the survivors, of genocide, the perspective of the international community commenting on the response or lack of a response to genocidal violence, and finally, the cultural and ideological perspective of the groups that committed genocidal atrocities. Social science never takes the reductive position that a group of people is simply evil or inherently violent. We reject that kind of categorical thinking. Instead, we use qualitative methods to explore the historical, political, and economic factors that led to the development of ideologies that support mass murder as a cultural practice. And in this episode of Off the Shelf, I want to talk about the triangle of violence and the different methods that anthropologists use to explore each of these three perspectives, as well as how, in some cases, anthropological methods have historically been used to support and empower genocidal campaigns. That's something we don't like to talk about very often, but it is an unavoidable topic if we're going to discuss the anthropology of genocide. <laughs> In discussing genocide from a social science perspective, we immediately run into problems with the legal definition of the term. Article 2 of the 1948 United Nations Genocide Convention, which provides the legal framework for the study and prosecution of genocide in the International Criminal Court, defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Uh, this includes mass murder, which is probably what most people imagine when they think of genocide, but also physical mutilation, injury, and psychological trauma, uh, deliberately placing the group in an environment that would cause mass death. Uh, for example, depriving people of food, water, and shelter in order to kill them, imposing policies that prevent the birth of new children, for instance, implemented on a mass scale, uh, forced abortions, general mutilation, or state-sanctioned sterilization programs, and finally, forcibly removing children from the victim group and placing them in the custody of different groups in society. And at first glance, this definition is pretty comprehensive. It seems to cover a lot of ground. So what exactly is the problem here? Well, one of the most common grievances with the 1948 convention is that it doesn't include the mass killing of groups based on political identity, physical ability, or sexual orientation in the legal definition of genocide, which, in my opinion, is a pretty serious omission. It makes it difficult, for example, to account for things like the Soviet liquidation of the Kulaks and other enemies of the state in the 1920s and 30s, or the execution of tens of thousands of so-called social deviants in the early 1940s in territories controlled by the Nazis. That would include the mass murder of Communist Party members, homosexuals, the differently abled, and people with psychiatric illnesses. And the absence of these groups from the UN's definition of genocide is often discussed in the literature as a kind of legal equivocation that reflects the unique political tensions faced by the UN in the late 1940s. In fact, in earlier draft of the 1948 convention, the United Nations Preliminary Resolution 96I did include the phrase political and other groups in its definition of genocide, but that language was dropped from the 1948 convention for a variety of highly political reasons that I'll discuss in the video description below. 
Now, shifting gears to look at this from an anthropological perspective, there are a number of additional problems with the UN Convention that make it difficult to use the legal definition of genocide in social science research. And this is simplifying things quite a bit, but the most fundamental issue is that the language of the UN Convention is drawn primarily from a very limited European and North American understanding of identity. But anthropologists have repeatedly shown that there are many other types of relevant social classifications. Things like tribes, totemistic groups, clans, uh, fratries and other kinship groups, castes, social classes, and of course economic and political groups, any of which could just as easily serve as the basis for mass violence and state-sanctioned persecution. In other words, from an anthropological perspective, the legal and linguistic framing of the 1948 UN Convention is severely limited and makes it much more likely to recognize genocides in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where the emic or insider's understanding of identity-based violence might be completely different from what we would recognize in popular Western discourses. Now, where and when genocide is actually prosecuted by the ICC is a completely different and inherently political question. But to avoid some of these issues for the remainder of the episode, I'm going to be using the term genocide in a broader sense that I've adapted from Helen Fine's article, Genocide, a Sociological Perspective. And Fine's definition states that genocide is sustained and purposeful action by a perpetrator to physically destroy a group directly or indirectly through the interdiction or destruction of the biological and social reproduction of group members. This definition foregrounds the idea that genocide goes beyond mass violence and occurs when a group's ability to perpetuate itself and its cultural identity is destroyed. So this includes the types of physical genocide outlined in the UN Charter, but also includes cultural genocide or ethnocide, which is the destruction of a group's way of life and the erasure of its historical identity, and ecocide, the destruction of a group's ecosystems leading to mass death. Uh, now, there are many, many other taxonomies of genocide that we could discuss, but now that we have this, I'm going to call it a broad working definition of the term, we can start to explore how social science has contributed to our understanding of genocidal violence and the ideologies that support it. If you get online and look up the anthropology or sociology of genocide, which you should absolutely go do, you'll find something a little bit strange, or something that was at least strange to me. With the exception of the Holocaust, there's very little research on genocide published before the mid-1990s, which is really late in comparison to a lot of other sub-disciplines in anthropology. In fact, the field of genocide studies, which grew out of Holocaust studies, only really began to produce a reflexive body of literature and open academic departments in the 1980s, and it took a decade really for that to translate into serious research on mass violence and genocide in cultures around the world, which raises an obvious question that we do have to confront. Why did it take anthropologists so long to begin to study genocide? Well, going through the literature, there are a number of different answers to that question, one of the most interesting of which, I think, is anthropology's relationship to cultural relativism. In case you don't know, cultural relativism is the very simple idea that cultural values, like ethics, are historical products. They are not universal. And therefore, we shouldn't ethnocentrically assume that the values of our society are more legitimate or superior than the beliefs of other people in other places and other times. Following from the work of Franz Boas in the early 20th century, this perspective became one of the guiding principles, the axioms of anthropological research. And we're usually quick to point out that relativism plays an important role in pushing back against cultural imperialism, and adopting a relativist approach is what allows us to conduct research without attempting to change the beliefs and behaviors of the people that we study, which is essential to good faith social science. But authors like Alexander Hinton argue that this approach to social science has also played a key role in preventing or discouraging anthropologists from focusing on genocidal violence, even while they often study other forms of localized violence or do research in communities that are experiencing the social and cultural repercussions of genocide, which may sound strange, 
But consider that if you approach genocide or any kind of ideologically motivated violence from the perspective of cultural relativism, if you accept that the ethical judgments of other societies are just as legitimate as your own, then condemning ideologically motivated violence can easily be criticized as a form of ethnocentrism, which is something that anthropologists, and particularly ethnographers, are always keen to avoid. Now, one of the other major factors that slowed the development of the anthropology of genocide is that many disciplines in social science were historically complicit in one way or another in numerous genocides since the beginning of the 19th century. And anthropology, unfortunately, is no exception. It's not something we like to talk about, but the discipline of anthropology has a long history of complicity in state-sanctioned mass violence. And this is true in a number of different ways, one of the most obvious being the role played by anthropologists in the 19th and early 20th centuries in the administration and the ideological justification of colonial governments around the world. Early armchair theorists like Herbert Spencer, Lewis Morgan, and James Fraser, for example, advocated a concept called unilinear cultural evolution. They proposed that all human societies advanced through the same stages of development, moving through what they called savagery, which they equated with the mental capacity of children, to the state of civilization, which was equated with the mental capacity of adults. And, of course, they felt that the peak of human civilization that everyone should aspire to was their own 19th century European and North American culture and society. And similar evolutionary typologies were proposed for race, creating an entire body of deeply flawed cultural and biological pseudoscience that consistently privileged a Eurocentric perception of history and of the world. This totalizing hierarchical perspective on race and culture was endemic in the early social sciences and provided really one of the foundational ideological justifications for colonization and later the continued marginalization of post-colonial populations in the 20th and, still, 21st centuries. In other words, working from the Enlightenment belief in progress and the possibility of discovering scientific laws underlying social development and change, early anthropology, in addition to many enormous and lasting contributions to human knowledge, also provided a pseudoscientific justification for the sentiment that less technologically advanced groups of people are implicitly less human, or at least intrinsically inferior, and therefore more disposable. And that sentiment is at the heart of nearly every single colonial genocide or instance of colonial mass violence in history, from the eradication of the Herero in German Southwest Africa and the sprawling legacy of colonial violence across the Americas, all the way to more recent governmental policies, like the system of apartheid in South Africa, which was heavily inspired by Volkekunde, which is a quasi-anthropological tradition that emerged among Afrikaans speakers in modern-day South Africa. And there are many, many more examples that we could talk about, but specialists in genocide studies often point out that this legacy of cultural and racial pseudoscience weighed particularly heavily in the development of the social sciences and affected the types of subjects that anthropologists felt capable of studying in the second half of the 20th century, thus slowing the development of social science research on genocide. As a consequence, the challenge faced by anthropologists as they began to research genocidal violence in the 1980s and 90s was to develop a body of social theory that was built on a deep historical understanding of how social science has been manipulated in the past to facilitate mass violence, as well as how pseudoscientific social theory is propagated today across social media, in propaganda, and in our political discourses, and how that pseudoscience can then be weaponized and transformed into an ideology that supports mass murder. And the result of that research is, in my opinion, one of the most dynamic emergent fields in anthropology today. In the introduction, I mentioned that anthropologists studying mass violence often bring a unique point of view to their research that tries to understand and synthesize three different, often irreconcilable perspectives on genocide. And we sometimes call this 
the triangle of violence. In combining these three perspectives, one of the goals of anthropological research on genocide is to explain mass violence as a cultural phenomenon, tracing out the cultural and ideological roots of different instances of mass violence and their profound psychological, social, and material effects, and in doing so, potentially contribute to the prevention of genocides in the future. So I want to take a little bit of time to talk about each point in this triangle, and the different ways in which social science can contribute to our understanding of and responses to genocide in cultures around the world. Beginning with the perspective and experiences of the victim group, this is an area where qualitative social science brings a lot to the table. In his contribution to Annihilating Difference, Kenneth Roth, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, notes that one of the main issues faced by human rights activists in developing post-genocide strategies is the debate on how best to rebuild societies and support victim groups that were targeted by genocidal campaigns. And that work raises a lot of difficult questions. Are those communities for example, best served by closing the book on the horrors in their past and trying to move forward, or by insisting that those responsible for genocide are held accountable? Is that accountability best established through public truth-telling or through international criminal tribunals? Is amnesty an appropriate act of forgiveness, or is amnesty a potentially naive strategy that might invite mass violence and persecution in the future? For human rights activists, these are enormously important questions, the answers to which need to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis, assessing the particular needs and perspectives of the victim group, which can change and diversify over time. And if you watch some of my other videos, you'll know that that is exactly the type of research that qualitative methods are uniquely well-suited to perform. Studying and understanding the shifting perspectives and needs of a particular social group is basically the bread bread and butter of qualitative sociology and social anthropology, so it's not uncommon to find applied anthropologists embedded in post-genocide communities, working together with community leaders and human rights activists to support victim groups. And the research that comes out of those collaborations can help us better understand the relative effectiveness of different cultural approaches to things like grief, reconciliation, and accountability. One excellent example would be May Ebihara and Judy Ledgerwood's work in Cambodia, exploring how families began to re-establish social and kinship networks after the Cambodian genocide of 1975 to 1979. And you'll find similar, also really excellent work done by Beatrice Manns in Guatemala and Tony Shapiro Pim on the role of dance and community-based music as a form of resistance and cultural revival in post-genocide communities. And I'll try to think of a few other examples to drop in the video description below, but what this body of research shows is that that qualitative social scientists use the skill set of ethnography to study how individuals and communities cope with the trauma of surviving genocide. That not only helps with truth-telling, uh, creating an emic survivor's account of genocidal violence, but it also gives us a window into the lived experiences of survivors, and that allows other specialists like medical anthropologists, doctors and psychologists, and aid workers to potentially adapt their work to better suit the needs of specific victim groups or to develop more flexible approaches to supporting victim groups in the future. The anthropological approach to studying international responses to genocide is considerably different. It's much closer to human rights activism and draws much more heavily from critical theory, about which we have a video if you'd like to know more. And this approach is grounded in the sentiment that perspectives on violence, particularly mass violence, can never be politically neutral, even if we're just peripheral observers, only partially aware of the details of an ongoing genocide our response to that violence will be conditioned by our own cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds, and of course our personal political beliefs. And this is as true for individuals as it is for organizations and governments. So from this perspective, if a government or non-governmental organization chooses to act in order to prevent a genocide, that's a political decision, in the same way that a government choosing inaction or choosing to understate the impact of a genocide is also a political decision. In other words, the scope and human cost of genocide is so large that inaction becomes an inherently political choice, a choice that often reflects what Kenneth Roth calls the deadly calculus of passivity. 
To pick one example from many, as the Maya genocide unfolded across Guatemala's indigenous community in the 1980s, the United States at different times either overlooked, underreported, or denied the genocide, due in large part to U.S. support for the Guatemalan government's hardline anti-communist policies. Authors like Victoria Sanford, who's the director of the Center for Human Rights and Peace Studies at Lehman College, have written extensively on the political motivations underlying the U.S. response or calculated lack of a response to the Maya genocide. Now, anthropologists studying mass violence have historically had very little impact on governmental policy on a large scale. But what we can do in the case of mass violence is to make inaction more costly for those in power by highlighting both the feasibility of action and using discourse analysis, deconstructing the pseudoscientific narratives and propagandist messaging that facilitate genocidal campaigns. After reporting on the war crimes trial of the mass murderer Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the chief architects of the Holocaust, the political philosopher and author Hannah Arendt, who was herself a Holocaust survivor, wrote that the trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were, and still are, terribly and terrifyingly normal. What shocked Arendt and formed the basis of her book Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, was not that Adolf Eichmann was an inhuman monster. What was more terrifying, Arendt felt, was that after hearing his testimony, he appeared to be, in her words, nothing more than a shallow and banal bureaucrat. Now, seeing a mass murderer like Eichmann in that light raised a deeply troubling and highly controversial question that haunts a lot of Arendt's writing on the Holocaust. If these people were not criminally insane or somehow inherently evil, then how could Eichmann and so many others like him in the bureaucratic machinery of the Third Reich knowingly organize and oversee the murder of millions of human beings? And approaching genocide from an anthropological perspective, that's a question that we can ask of every single government or paramilitary organization that has perpetuated genocide throughout history. In the introduction, I mentioned that social science never takes the reductive position that a group of people is inherently violent or somehow evil. We reject that kind of categorical thinking and instead view human beings as products to a greater or lesser degree of the cultural, environmental, socioeconomic, and historical forces that shape their beliefs and inform their actions. So when anthropologists study the perspective of the individuals who have perpetuated genocide, we use qualitative methods to situate their violence in a historical and cultural context. And our goal in doing that is to understand how the ideologies that support mass murder emerged and developed in the past, and hopefully to use that knowledge to prevent genocidal violence in the future. Now, a lot of the best historical work that's been done in this respect focuses on Germany in the 1930s and 40s, and the role played by pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, and crackpot archaeology in fabricating the foundational mythology of the Third Reich. A two really good researchers working in that field are Bettina Arnold and Gretchen Schaft, and their work shows how early 20th century German archaeologists, for example, like Gustav Cosina, intentionally misrepresented archaeological evidence to create a mythic narrative of the cultural and ethnic superiority of the Germanic peoples. So aspects of Arnold and Schaff's research explore how pseudoscience contributes to the supremacist ideologies that inform fascist movements. Similar uh, ethnographic work in a different part of the world has been done by Lisa Malky and Christopher Taylor on the Rwandan genocide of 1994, and I would highly recommend Tony Bringa's work on the genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina from 1992 to 1995. In both of those cases, in very different ways, mythology, bad faith historical research, and pseudoscience also played significant roles in the development of genocidal ideologies. And there are many other examples that I could mention, I'll put some in the video description, but what this combination of historical and ethnographic research gives us is an answer to Hannah Arendt's question that's informed by qualitative social science. Now, this video is already long enough, um, so I'm not going to go into that answer in depth in this video. It's a huge topic, 
and really deserves a dedicated discussion of its own, but if you're interested, let me know in the comments below, and I'll put together a video discussing the different ways that social scientists have theorized and attempted to understand the ideologies that inform mass violence. Now I should mention that in this video I did not cover two significant areas in which anthropologists and historians have made contributions to genocide studies. Uh, the first is forensic archaeology, the way that specialized archaeologists have worked in the past to study mass graves, to assess the scale of war crimes, or to assist in the prosecution of genocide in the International Criminal Court. That's a very important applied branch of archaeology that does play a role in broader anthropological research. And the second is the role played by historians and social scientists in organizing and curating what are called memorial museums, of which there are many, but the most famous and archetypal is probably the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which was opened in 1993 in Washington, D.C. These are typically hybrid institutions that are simultaneously a memorial to the victims of genocidal violence and what some authors call experiential museums, museums that are focused less on the traditional functions of collecting, archiving, and displaying, and are more oriented towards teaching and designing exhibits that provoke a subjective, emotional response, telling the story of the past in a way that helps the visitors understand and empathize with the victims of these almost unimaginable atrocities. And you'll find anthropologists and historians not just writing about and theorizing these museum spaces, but also involved in their planning, design, and curation, which is another way that social scientists can potentially contribute to post-genocide communities. And both of these would also be great topics for videos. Uh, so if that's something you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comments below. So that's the episode. I hope that you found it interesting. Uh, this one took a long time to put together. It's a challenging topic at the best of times, but I found it particularly difficult to find a tone that worked as a writer, presenter, and editor. But I certainly hope that I did and that you found the video helpful. If you did, you know, do all of the YouTube things like subscribe, ring the bell, but also come on over and check us out on Patreon, where we post scripts, comprehensive reading lists, and additional written content for almost all of our videos. And if that sounds interesting and you'd like to be a supporter of independent social science pedagogy on the platform, consider becoming one of our patrons, like these wonderful people right here. Um, speaking of whom, I'd like to thank one of my patrons, Kaylee Whalen, for talking through aspects of the project while the video was in editing. That was extremely helpful, and if I ever have the opportunity to make a follow-up video on memorial museums in the future, it's going to be in large part because of that input. So thank you very much. I hope to see all of you next time, and until then, never stop learning.